I'm going to read to you in one, but what I'd like to do first, and I don't want you to think this is a religious service, but nevertheless, at the very end, as I round things off, I want to go back to a, a, a Bible theme and tie in what we've heard from Linvoy with what we're about to read. So I want to read a little section from the Bible. For those of you who are familiar with church, this is a very, very familiar passage. It was written 2,700 years ago by a man called Isaiah. And he had an amazing vision that was to change him completely. I just want to read uh, a little bit of the passage. It's in Isaiah chapter 6. If you want to follow it in the Bible, you can. Uh, but otherwise, uh, let me read just for a minute or two. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, when he had taken the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and say to the people, Well then, we're told what he has to say to the people, but we'll leave it there, we'll come back to that uh, little incident of, well, after I've interviewed. Uh, it's great to have you invite, all the way from the very south coast, but let's give him a very warm welcome, shall we? <laughs> so, Portsmouth. Portsmouth. Why on earth? Sorry, <laughs> can you guys know you're going to Portsmouth? Yeah, why? Um, lucky enough, football uh, took me there. Before I signed for Portsmouth, I done been, I think I done been there twice. And uh, when they said I was going to go and sign on my agent, said about going to sign, I thought, where am I going? I don't even know where I'm going. So I'm quite familiar with Portsmouth now. It's a lovely part of the world. In fact, I think a stadium, the football game, is named after you. Isn't That's it? right. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. We'll come on to that shortly. So where, where were you born? So I was born in uh, Stratford. Uh, East London, so not too far. I'm not South from Haven. No, not quite. 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 Yeah, London. And uh, tell us about your family. Yeah, so um, mum and dad, um, born uh, in the West Indies. Uh, mum from Jamaica, dad from St. Vincent. I've got an older brother as well. And um, yeah, so um, my mum and dad met. Yeah, the motors. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come all the way over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, live down on the south coast with us now. So. Uh, and, and your brother is he a footballer as well? No, he, he was a um, quite fast runner. So he was an athlete. He was in the era of um, Linda Christie, um, but he always felt that if he couldn't be number one, why bother competing? So he chose to go into accountancy. <laughs> <laughs> Were you always, you, you know, good with football? Um, no, <laughs> the, the, the answer, simple answer. I don't think I was even as a professional. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, no, I think what it, for me, I was, sport was, uh, I was always drawn to sport. I was an active kid, um, living in high rise block flats, um, you know, to, to get out and play. Getting freedom was great. Um, um, I suppose the, the idea of playing football uh, came about because of a game that I watched on TV, a cup final between Manchester City and Tottenham. And um, Ricky Velia for Tottenham scores this amazing goal. And I think to myself, well, if he can do it, so can I. So, um, <laughs> so I set up a football pitch in my mum and dad's corridor playing, ag <laughs> playing against my teddy bears. And, uh, and I scored a few goals and won a few games. But, um, but that was my Wembley. And that, that's where my uh, love for football 
football started. Now, West Indian, you know, there's often a sort of God-fearingness about the West Indians. Were you going to church as a little lad? Were your family taking you to church? Yes, I was going to church. Um, you know, I can't say that church appealed to me because the, the biggest thing for me, my friends were all outside playing football, so that's where I wanted to be. But, yeah, my, my grandparents would always watch Songs of Praise on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> yes. we, were, we were normally there, so when Songs of Praise came on, the house had to be quiet and, you know, the grandkids were always getting in trouble, me and uh, my cousins. Um, Mum and Dad, yeah, faithfully went to church and I went along as well. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I, I knew about um, Christmas, knew about Easter, knew about God, knew about Jesus, but I didn't understand much more than that. And, uh, but at that time, I wanted God to be football and, uh, and, I, okay. and I chased But if dream. I'd met you, say, as a 13-year-old in Roy and said, are you a Christian, what would you have said? Um, no. So you knew there was something that wasn't genuine about That's your... That's right, yeah. yeah. I just thought there was two... Being a Christian was about being a good person and being in church every Sunday. Um, and I'd, I would have said, yeah, I go to church and I'm, I'm Church of England, but I wouldn't have said I was a Christian because I didn't understand what that meant and it looked... To be Christian, you had to be super holy. And, um, you know, it was. So, were you not super holy? Uh, of course, I was. Ask my mum. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was, a, there was a few things I got up to as a little kid, but. Um, All yeah. right. Yeah. So, when were you, as it were, spotted as a footballer? So, when I was uh, 14 years old, um, uh, I got spotted by Charlton, and that came about because. The manager of the Sunday team that I played for wrote to all the football clubs in London because he, he'd been in trouble in his life before and he said that he didn't want us to go down that same route and he believed in us and he believed that we were good enough to at least play schoolboy level at professional clubs. So it was real good, you know, there wasn't an email that you could just write one email no. and send to all, you know, <laughs> he literally wrote these letters and uh, Charlton wrote back and said, bring your team over to play us. We'll see, have a look at your players, and if we like them, we'll, we'll invite them back. And, and I was one of five that got invited back. And, and when you were playing this match, were mm. you aware that you were being observed? Yes, yeah, oh, definitely. So you knew that? Yeah, okay. definitely. Um, because, so you were invited back, and what yeah. happened then? So it was a case of training twice a week. Um, were you getting paid for this? No, I, I'd okay. get expenses. I think it was £2 to get on the, the bus, walk under the <laughs> Woolwich, uh, across the River Thames, under the, the tunnel, the foot tunnel, and come out and train. Um, but it was different because you, you were in a different environment. You know, the, it was the, the, the standard was good, but the, the competitive nature of it was different. You know, you, even though they were your teammates, you realised that they wanted it so much because we all wanted the same thing to become professionals. And it was a case that if we played in the same position, there would only be one of us playing in that position. So yeah. you had to be better than yeah. your teammate. So I recognised early on that it wasn't just about ability, it was about your attitude as well. Um, yeah. So for, for a couple of years, it was training on a Tuesday and a Thursday and hopefully getting picked to play on the Saturday or the uh, Sunday. Were you a hero at school? Because everyone would know, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. I was a bit of a hero. Um, and because I grew up in an area where there were a lot of famous footballers who, who, um, who played for England. So, um, you know, because we knew about those players, if you were selected to play for a professional team as a schoolboy, it was, oh, you must be OK because mm. so-and-so's good and he's there and that means you, you're in the same category as, as them. But little did they realise that even just playing for, um, for, for Charlton didn't mean that you'd make the, the grade, no. you know, there was still a lot of hard work. Well, there was work. a lot of disappointment as well, oh, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, very much okay. so. So two years playing, and yeah. then? Then uh, the opportunity to get taken on an, as an apprentice was, uh, was available, but only if the manager thought you were good enough for the two years that he watched you. So for, for two years, I trained with about 40, 45 boys who were all wanting to get this apprenticeship, there were only five apprenticeships available, wow. and, um, and I was one of the five that got selected. But at that point, I saw how uh, football can um, really change people's lives. I, the, the night that we were told whether we were going to get kept on or released, um, 35 boys were, I'd never ever see again, you know. And mm. we'd, been, we'd been teammates for two years, and now I was never going to see them again. And I saw tears, anger, pain. Um, but I was the only other side of that. I, I was relieved and happy, but I also thought to myself, I never want to be in that position that those guys are in. 
So that motivated you? Was it a motivation of fear? Fear, yeah. definitely. But on the other hand, um, two days later, West Ham offered me an apprenticeship as well. And West Ham were the, the big boys, you know. They're, they're, if you grew up in East London, they were the team to follow. And if they selected you, you went. And I remember saying to my dad, what should I do? You know, mm. and my dad would normally say, you know, yes, no, or just tell me the right thing. He said, Lynn, go with your heart. And I went, heart? Dad, just tell me, you know. Uh, but what he was really saying was, uh, think about who gave you the opportunity. Think about them first before you make a decision to go to the big time. And I thought, you know what, Charlton gave me that opportunity first, so I'm going to be loyal and stick with Charlton. So that's what I've done. And did they respect that loyalty, do you think? Um, early on, probably. I, I say probably because you never get a gauge, a true gauge of no. what's going on no. in coaches' minds. Um, because are you just making up the numbers? Are you, uh, you know, are you going to be part of a, a team going forward? Because even in those two years of being an apprentice, you know, you, you, you're going from a boy to, uh, you're going from a school environment to a, uh, a working environment with men. And the, the language is different. You're training every day. So physically, it's a demand on you. Um, mentally, it's a demand. You know, the, in that time, there's so many injuries that the young players pick up because your mm. body's not used to it. Mm. But psychologically, you're dealing with, will I get back into the team again? You know, can I show anybody <clears throat> the fears that I have? And everything like that's running around. And in the end, you isolate yourself and you put on this brave front, I'm the big man, but really, uh, you're not quite. Amazing, mm. really. It's a different <clears throat> take on it all, isn't it? So if mm. I was a 12-year-old who was good at football, mm. that's a very big if on many <laughs> fronts. But if I was, would you recommend me to go for it or not? I'd still say go for it. Because, would you? Yeah, yeah, because I think you, you, your passion and your desire to, to play sport will never go if that's what you really like doing but I'm, you, I could never work out what level you'll play at because as you grow up and you develop you know you physically you could be strong enough physically you might not be so I'd say go for it but you know mentally you have to be really tough um, because if you are in that industry for 10 to 15 years you have to have a tough, tough uh, attitude and the right mentality. And not everyone is going to be a Wayne Rooney, are they? It's no, like, uh, well, that's the thing, you know. Even but you dream of that. You dream of kid, that, yeah. yeah. You dream of the, you know, playing in the the big stadiums. You mm. obviously football's a lot different now from when I was coming into it. That the, you know, the extravagance of what you can have very quickly um, it, it has changed. But the desire to to get out there and kick a ball never changes. Really? Yeah. So go on, Charlton to Portsmouth. How did you get there? Good. Um, yeah, it was a funny way round. But the two, the two years uh, of being an apprentice, um, at the end of that, I got offered a professional contract out of the, 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 the five. plus. So there's five in my group and there was an older group as well. Uh, only two professional contracts got offered. So, you know, so I'd gone from... 40 down to, to five and got the apprenticeship then then down to two to get that professional contract and the manager said that's the easiest contract you're going to get and I thought hold on a minute I've just beaten all those you know guys yes. to get this yes. but he said now you're up against grown men you know you're the, the those your teammates have got bills they've got families they've got uh, a lifestyle that they want to keep and, and that, these are all very real pressures are they oh yeah. yeah yeah because the manager didn't want you to just sit back and relax and yeah. think i've made it yeah and um and he was right it was it, it wasn't easy so i signed my professional contract uh a year later i made my league debut uh, live on tv um we drew nil nil i got man of the match did you yeah had mm -hmm. to do an interview the worst interview ever you know <laughs> I let out all the secrets that Charlton had no money and, you know, <laughs> it wasn't good. Um, and at the end of that interview, I got a big bottle of champagne and, and I thought I'd made it. Uh, I played six more games or five more games. And then I got told the following season that I could leave the club, that I wasn't good enough. Um, and so that was the first major disappointment. The first major yeah. disappointment. And, and I suppose at that point, when you look back, it, the manager's like your father. You know, if he selects you, he's pleased with you. If he doesn't select you, he's not happy with you. If he says you can leave the club, it's all over. So that was my first uh, moment of rejection, failure, uh, all the anxiety of what am I going to do next? I'd just become a dad. So, you know, so I wasn't just looking, out for my, looking after myself, I was looking after my family now. 
Um, and it was a, a tough time. Any thoughts of God at this time? Uh, yeah, in the sense of, God, why are you doing this to me? What have I done? What have I done badly? You know, uh, even though I, I didn't have a relationship where I was going to church or understood who God was. But the obvious thing is, when things go bad, who do you blame? You know, I was never going to blame myself because I thought I was right. Um, so there were a, a few thoughts of God, but it was a case that he's, he's let me down. Um, so from, from uh, leaving Charlton, I went to Barnet. And that wasn't easy, an easy time either because you're not guaranteed uh, a new club or a new contract when you finish playing because there's a, there was a stat many years ago that said if there was 100 footballers that got uh, signed as pros as 18-year-olds, by the time you got to 22, there'd only be 10 pros mm. so 90 guys mm. out of the out of the game so um so for me to go to barnet was was a a, a good opportunity a lucky opportunity that i uh, i thought that landed in my lap and um and i had a choice at that point as well i could have gone to cardiff on trial or signed a professional uh, signed a, a a contract a two-year contract with barnet and i remember saying to the barnet manager look i've promised cardiff that i'm going to go and have this trial and out of loyalty, I need to do that. So the Barnet manager just said to me, look, I'm going to speak to the chairman and just see if we can offer you something. And I said, that's great, but I've got to go to Cardiff. So he rang me back. The Barnet manager rang me back and said, Lynn, there's a two-year contract on the table. What do you want to do? And I said, I'll be there in two minutes. You know, I said, forget loyalty because, <laughs> you know, what does loyalty get you? But in all honesty, I just wanted security yeah. for my family and myself. Um, spent three years there. Right. Uh, played with a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. Um, what? Because of this pressure, you're going to be dropped again. Pressure being dropped. Um, am I good enough? Uh, is the manager going to, you know, be the same as the last manager? But the uh, the thing that I had to use to overcome that was uh, anger, anger at Charlton, anger at the, the the world of football. So I used to go onto the pitch as a different person. You know, I used to, to suppress all that fear. Anger was, uh, was my, was my really? driver, yeah. Really? So, because I couldn't show any weakness. Because if you show any weakness in that environment, it's an opportunity for your teammates to have a little pop at you or the fans to say something about you or the local press to say something or the national press when they give you a ratings to say something. And and so you take note of what the press uh, are saying. And oh, if, yeah. You, do you? You read the newspapers yeah, about yourself? Yeah, because one of the things... The gauge, the sense of if you're doing well is what other people are saying. That's what you're led to believe. And, uh, but you quickly realise that one person might think you've played well, somebody else th yeah. doesn't think you play well. But those, those voices that you hear really set you up for what comes next, unless you've got a character that says, I don't care what people say. But deep down, you do. You do, everybody yeah, does, yeah. yes. Okay, so come on, we're not at Portsmouth. Yeah, so from Reading, uh, from Barnet, I went to Reading. Uh, so all those fears, you know, weren't, were, were, were hidden well because uh, Reading wanted to sign me for quite a big fee. Uh, moved there, uh, moved out of London for the first time, bought a house, had the car, had a, a young daughter now. So as a family, you know, the 4.2 family, the... the the lifestyle um, and everything, everything on paper said that my life should be really happy, but I still wasn't satisfied. And uh, the only time I thought I'd find satisfaction was playing against Charlton again and beating them and proving, you know, and I thought if that moment comes around, there'll be peace throughout the world, you know. <laughs> Um, and the opportunity came, we won. Uh, I'd rehearsed for three years what I was going to say to the manager, you know, because it was real, you know, what he'd done to me as a 20-year-old could have, uh, could have really affected mm. my family and myself mm. in, a, in, a, in a much bigger way. And I'd rehearsed what I was going to say. And after the game, I, I found him and um, you know, shook <laughs> his hand. I didn't let go. Oh. You know, he tried to let go. <laughs> and before I could say anything, he said, Linvoy, well done. You've Did he? Yeah, he said, you've proved us wrong. And I, f I thought, great, you've just stole my punchline, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I, I, I remember walking away thinking, now what? You know, now what? So I chased money for a little while. And that didn't, you know, bring the happiness that we thought it would. And then my wife uh, started to suffer with depression. And uh, now, when you say so, sorry, mm, suffer, sure, yeah. um, suffer with depression, was this because I don't know the world that she imagined she was going to enjoy wasn't quite great, or, or was yeah. it just a clinical depression that had no 
obvious cause. Yeah, well, I, I think back at, at that point, we, we weren't quite sure what was going on. The, the obvious thing for us then was that we were very lonely because the friends we had in London couldn't come and visit us as often. So the new friends we were trying to make saw us as the footballer and the wife, oh, right, and okay. they wanted to take stuff from us, yeah. whether it was friendships, whether it, whatever it looked like. So we were very guarded, yeah. and because of that, we became very lonely. And we, we were, you know, as a couple, we were very social, but all of a sudden, we were just living. We felt like we was in a prison. So when um, I'd go to train... Uh, Trish would be at home, the you know, kids would go to school and she had no one to mm. speak to. Then I'd come home and I didn't really have a conversation because it'd be, what did you do today, Lynn? Oh, <laughs> kick the ball. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kick yeah. the ball in the net. Oh, I missed yeah. the, you know. Yeah. So, so we became very lonely. So and were your moods greatly affected by whether you were winning or losing? Oh, definitely, definitely, because that's so what you're judged on. Were not particularly pleasant to know at home if you just lost? Yeah, you know, if we had a, a, a cat, I wouldn't have kicked the cat, but, you know, I, w I wasn't happy because our, our life was judged on the results that people throughout the world of football could see. So when we take the kids to school, oh, you lost at the weekend. Oh, really? yeah, you really? must be rubbish. And or, that was just the little kids? That was just the little <laughs> kids, yeah. <laughs> so they never, my kids didn't have friends then, you know, we keep them away. <laughs> Um, so in all of that, in all the mix, I, I started to think to myself, yeah. well, what is this about? You know, I'm doing the thing I love, still not happy, got the things that the world says makes you happy, still not happy. And in the end, I'd just come into a, a, a time in my contract with Reading where I thought, I want what I deserve. You know, I've given my all and I don't feel I've been rewarded well, so I want what I deserve. And, and I wasn't given that. And there were two thoughts to that. If we've got more money, we're, as a family, we're going to be happier. Yeah. And also, if they don't give us the money, we can go, we can get out. You know? And that's yeah. where we were, because I thought, if we, get, if we can get everything we want, we'll be happy. If we don't, we'll go back to London, get around our friends again, and be happy. Yeah. So my last contract with, uh, my contract with Reading ran out. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have anyone to play for. I was 26, just coming up to my 27th birthday. Nearly passed it. Nearly passed it on the way down, you know. <laughs> and, um, and in the end, it was a case of, right, you know, let's, let's see what comes up next. And then Portsmouth came up. Portsmouth. When you say it came up, what do you mean? Did they headhunt you or did you, no. did you send in your CV and yeah, say, yeah. hello? Cool, hello, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ed, uh, anyone want a, uh, an old player? No. Um, football's interesting in the sense that it's a very small community. Uh, that and you all know each other? R yeah, reasonably well, yeah. well yeah. reasonably well, to say hi to, um, but you don't really make friends in football because <laughs> the friends you might make might take your contract. Yeah. So, um, so you, you know, it's very, even though we're a team, it's, you're very much an individual. Um, so what had happened, and this was the interesting thing, the manager of Reading used to be my old teammate and... Uh, so the contract he offered me really hurt me. And I thought, you know, if we're supposed to be friends off the pitch and you've offered me this, mm. what do you really think of me? Mm. So by leaving, he, he phoned me up and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm going, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to quit football. He said, no, you can't. I said, I'm quitting. He said, you're too good to quit. And I said, well, you've treated me the way you have. What's mm. the use? Yeah. And then I told him about my wife and he was like, oh, Lynn, why didn't you tell me? I said... I'm not going to come into this environment and, and reveal my secrets because that could be used against me. Mm. And he said, Lynn, look, I don't want you to come out of football. I'm going to ring a couple of football clubs and just see if they'll take you mm. on trial. So credit to him, he did. Yeah. And, and Portsmouth was one of the clubs. And Portsmouth were in a higher division. And a lot of managers will look after themselves by not allowing one of your key players to go leave the club for nothing and go up in the higher division because it looks like it's bad, bad management. Mm. But he allowed me to, to, to go and have this uh, trial with Portsmouth. And after two weeks, Portsmouth signed me. And this was going to be the defining moment for you. Yes. Well, let's break there for a moment because we've got a video we're going to watch. And I think this is some of the, the better moments, isn't it? Yeah, it's only so, four minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> we've only been out every Yeah, yeah, in 15 years, <laughs> four minutes. <laughs> All right, let's have a look at this. 
Great. Now, I'm not quite sure how many goals we saw there because they seem to be shown from different yeah, angles several right. times. Well it's done, uh, Roger. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I try and hold back from saying that, but yes. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, and, and what was that cup you were holding? That was the FA Cup. Uh, Go on, tell us we, about yeah, it. Yeah, we won in 2008. Um, amazing, really, because I always remember my parents taking me to the old Wembley and, um, you know, you, you do the tour, you go in the dressing rooms and then you're able to, to go up the steps and you can hold the, the fake FA Cup. And then there's some, <laughs> someone behind, you know, with a, with a button on the speaker just turning it and, like, there's a crowd cheering. So, <laughs> so you think, you're, you know, it's actually happening. But I remember coming down and saying to my mum and dad, one day I'm going to hold the real FA Cup and, uh, and I was able to do it. Amazing. There, yeah. it, is that, you know, looking back, because you must have memories that you sometimes mm. reflect on. Yeah. Is that the moment for you? Um, not, not really, because it, it was bittersweet, because I was injured throughout that season, so I didn't play one game. Um, so, and I remember an hour after the game thinking to myself, oh, wow. Well, no, sorry, an hour, yeah, an hour, sorry, as soon as we won the cup, for the next hour I was really low, because I'd been involved in a lot of big moments for the football club, and uh, to not be part of that team on the pitch it was like really hard to take. Was and then all of a sudden I just thought, Lynn, you're part of a squad that's just won the FA Cup, enjoy it. So I did, I enjoyed it. Nice. Um, so it, it, it wasn't, it was a good moment, but I think the biggest moment for me in terms of uh, personal achievement was um, promotion to the Premier League because there was a lot that went on before uh, we, we started that season where my future at the football club was in doubt. Mm. And then I ended up playing and, um, you know, getting promoted to the, the Prem. So you played some of the really big teams and the big players. Yes, yeah. Do you count Leeds as one of those? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, got, I, I hope you're not a Leeds yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah, no, well, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, because we played them the game that they got relegated. So, oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, Forgive right. me, Roger. Yeah, no, I'm not that bothered. But anyway, okay, now... But what's happening spiritually then? These great years at Portsmouth, yeah. and yet to have a stand named after you mm. is pretty special, isn't yeah. it? So you, you're greatly loved. Were, were there issues though about racism? Because we picked that up in the, the music there. Were you, did you, were you suffering because of... No, no. Uh, I think in the world of, of football, there's a, a lot of... It's industrial language that goes on. And because you're in an environment where you're with guys, there's a lot of egos and everything like that. Things are said in the heat of the moment, you know, and there were racial remarks, but they weren't racial in terms of, I would say that person's a, ra uh, a racist. Yeah. It was said because it was different. It was something to pick up on. You know, it could be someone's weight, it could be their height, it could be the colour of their hair, but it was all done in the camaraderie of that dressing room. And you took it like that? Yeah, you? yeah. But yeah. what about from the crowd? From the crowd, uh, I never received or heard anything. I, I always said that probably because I wasn't good enough, they just left me alone, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but a couple of my teammates were on the receiving end of racial yeah. abuse and uh, that wasn't nice to hear. No. Um, but, you know, it's being ch tackled now in a good way. And, um, and I think it's just edu uh, educating people. That's mm. all it is. And, um, and what was happening spiritually then? Spiritually, um, there was a sense that the, the life that I was living, um, I wasn't fulfilling what I thought mm. uh, happiness was going to be. Um, and it, when I ask that question, there must be more to life than this. Mm. I think that, that at that point, the search was getting to a, a place where I needed to explore religion. Uh, because, and when I, what I mean by that, I, I saw lots of different religions out there mm. and thought, well, maybe this is the one I need that gives me peace. Maybe this is the one I need that gives me wisdom. Maybe this is the one that I need to, to give me strength. So, um, so there was a lot of thinking, obviously internally. I'd, I'd never ha had anyone to speak to about it again because you can't show any weakness. Mm. And then uh, my wife, uh, when we moved to Portsmouth, my wife said to me, Lynn, you know what, I'd, I'd like to get a horse. And I said, a horse? You know, we didn't have a, we didn't even own a cat or a dog, you know. So for her to say a horse, I thought you could at least come in with a rabbit or something. <laughs> but the reason she wanted to get a horse, because just before we moved from Reading, she was looking after a horse uh, on the stables. And she said, Lynn, these guys treated me as Trish. 
It wasn't about the football. It I wasn't the footballer's wife. Mm. I was Trish. And she said, if I can get back in that environment, I'm sure mm. that's going to help my, my recovery. So, you know, we agreed to get a horse and we got the horse and it wasn't best. We called it the wonky donkey because <laughs> it was always lame. It always had something <laughs> going wrong with it. And horses are expensive to look after at the best of times. But... Um, but this, the, the guys where we kept the horse found out I played football and took advantage of that. So we moved the horse to a new stables. And these guys at the stables were Christians. And they saw that Trish wasn't well. And uh, they started to speak to her about uh, just life generally. And then one day Trish came home to me and said, Lynn, uh, these guys are nice people. And I said, oh, that's good. You know, thinking she's making friends. Mm. And then she said, they're Christians. And I said, what? She said, they're, you know, they're Christians. I said, Trish, stay away. And she, said, and she said, why? They're nice people. I said, they always start off like that, but it will change. And I said, they want your money in the end, you know. So, uh, but it, for me, the reason I was so defensive is because I didn't trust anybody anymore. Mm. Church wasn't, wasn't relevant for me in terms of what I remembered as a kid. Mm. And it was a case of if we go there, you know, what difference is it going to make? So the last thing I said to Trish uh, was, if they invite you to church, say no. Just say no. <laughs> anyway, two weeks later, we're in church. So, uh, <laughs> and, and this is the thing, and I won't go into detail about the, the moment of walking into that church, but while we were in that church, everything that I remembered about church from a kid was gone. There was nothing that resembled church at all from what I remembered. There were chairs, there was a band. The guy that spoke from the front didn't have a collar on. And, and, and then he started to speak about his life being empty. And then, you know, and then knowing Jesus and knowing Jesus is, was alive today. And I'm thinking, this guy's mad. But the biggest thing for me, he was speaking about my life. Yes. And I thought, how does he know about me? And I'm thinking, I haven't got eye contact with him. You know, if he tried to get eye contact, my head was down. <laughs> and then once he said about Jesus, we left that church and I thought, I've got to investigate this. And yeah. my teammate at the football club was a Christian. Who was that? A, a guy called Darren Moore. And uh, so uh, he, when we used to play away games, we'd room together because of the players, you know, to save money, mm. you'd, you'd share a room. And, um, and I thought to myself, he must be a proper Christian because he'd open his kit bag, he'd pull out all his stuff and he'd pull out the Bible. Mm. But I thought to myself, footballers don't read, especially books that thick, you know. <laughs> we need pictures and stuff like that. But then I thought, I'm going to grill a Christian. I'm going to grill him. So I'd ask him questions and then I'd go to church secretly on a Sunday with my wife, ask them the same questions. They both had the same answers. And I'm thinking, Darren's phoned them up and told them the questions <laughs> I'm going to ask. But again, it was about trust and letting people into our lives. And in the air, after about six weeks, I just said, you know what, They're, they've got something. And it's only, again, looking back, what they had was peace. And I could see it in their eyes. And I said, I want what you guys have got. Tell me, what is it that you've got? Mm. And they just very, very quickly threw the Bible, showed me stories in the Bible, scripture in the Bible. And it used to annoy me when they used to open the Bible because I think they keep going to that book. Why well, I keep going to that book? Obviously, they were going to the truth. Yeah. And when they told me that the relationship was broken with, with, uh, with God through Adam and Eve being disobedient, and the only way the relationship could be restored was through Jesus, uh, I said, that's a bit deep. And I said, but what, what, what else does that mean? And they said, you can have the real life that you're supposed to have by accepting what Jesus done on the cross and what happened three days later. And I said, what happens next? And they said, that's it, you've got the relationship. And I said, what do I have to do? They said, just say a little prayer. I said, a little prayer? What do you mean a little prayer? And they, said, and they showed me this prayer in a Why Jesus book. And I thought, that's too easy. And I said, how much does it cost? And they, <laughs> said, <laughs> you know, and they said, nothing. I said, it must. We must have to pay something at some point. And they said, no, no, Lynn, you don't. So I thought, right, okay, then. I said, right, Trish, shall we say this prayer together? And Trish said, I've already said the prayer. And I went, what? You know? <laughs> and, uh, and she'd been away the week before and... Um, She'd been to uh, uh, Butlins with the kids. But as she was going, the, the church gave her some books, and one of them was the Why Jesus book. And I said to her, what, what happened when you read the book? And she said, Lynn, I said the prayer at the end, and she said the depression went instantly. Huh. And I knew you know, that it, it, it was real, because the first time we went into that church, Trish didn't even believe there was a God. So for her to read this book 
and it's tiny in terms of what you were reading, mm. but the impact it had on her, mm. I thought, if she's in, I'm in. So I, you know, I close my eyes, I say a little prayer, open up an eye. <laughs> you know, nothing happens. I think God's, I'm expecting God's hand to point and say, Linvoy, you're the man, but nothing. Um, apart from my friend tried to hug me and I went, Mm-mm, I don't do them hugs. <laughs> <laughs> I do them now, by the way. Well, um, you did them when you scored the one, yeah, two, exactly. well, one or two goals. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay. you, you have to hug people then. I never scored. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, but that was the moment where my life changed. It, it, there wasn't a, a light bulb moment. There wasn't anything significant that said, Lynn, you're, you know, the life you had yesterday is different today. There was nothing like that. But six weeks later, there was uh, with Darren and the club chaplain. Um, and at that moment, all I can tell you is that they prayed for me and this peace that I chased through football, through alcohol, through drugs, through cars, through holidays, this peace that just from head to toe, and I knew I'd met Jesus. Huh. So the, all the success didn't compare then with, no. with what... Okay. Did it change you on the football pitch? Did you start praying that you'd win? Yes. I was like, Lord, Did you? please <laughs> let me win. Please let me win. Let me, let me play well. Um, it, again, it was, I thought that when you become a Christian, you have to be a vicar. Or you have to... Um, you know, you, you can't play sport the way you used to. So... Fortunately for me, the chaplain of the football club was a, an ex-footballer huh. and he discipled me and I asked him these questions and he said, Lynn, no, God's given you a gift, you know, to play football. And I said, all right, okay, so can I tackle the same way? He said, just don't tackle as hard or a different <laughs> heart. Anyway, I got sent off twice as a Christian. So, <laughs> but, well, Jesus came into the world for sin. Yes, that's so it, yes. Yeah. So I did say forgive me, you know, yes. about them. But... Um, but the moment for me where things really changed was when Harry Redknapp became the Portsmouth manager and he said, Linvoy, you can leave the club. And <clears throat> all the emotions came back from a as a 20-year-old about yeah. rejection and yeah. failure. But the chaplain just said, Lynn, don't worry. God's got a plan for your life. And I thought, yeah, well, that's easy to say. And then he said, look, the Bible's alive today and it can deal with anything you're going through in your life. So I thought, oh, great, here we go. So he said, look, if God wants you at the club, He'll keep you. If he doesn't want you at the club, he'll let you go. So I thought, well, that's 50-50. You know, I could have said that. But then he said, Lim, what's more important is that you play for God now. And he gave me a verse in the Bible. And it just said, whatever you do in word or deed, do it for God. Mm. I was like, what does that mean? He said, play for the one that gave you the gift. He said, you've played for everybody else. Now play for the one that's giving you the gift. Mm. And that was hard because mm. my emotions were telling me, kick off. Go after the manager. Tell him that he's got it wrong. You know, be a nuisance in trade because that's what you do as a footballer. If you don't get your own way, you throw your toys out the pram. A tiny bit of me said, play for God. Anyway, two weeks later, Harry pulls me to the side and says, Lynn, I'm not going to sell you. In fact, I can't give you away, so I'm not going to get you that. <laughs> but he said, your attitude's been spot on. And I said internally, well, I'm doing this for God, Harry, not you. You know, externally, I was like, oh, thanks, gaffer. You know, cheers. <laughs> A week after that, the season starts not in the team. One of the players gets injured. Harry calls me and says, Lynn, you're playing. You're playing in a position you've never played before, but you're playing. I think, oh, why? And as I walk onto the pitch, I say, God, I'm doing this for you. I end up playing, every, uh, I think there's 46 games. I end up playing 44 games that season. Um, I end up having play, uh, getting man, player of the season. Huh. I win seven out of nine Player of the Month awards, which is, you know, a record. Mm -hmm. Win awards from other fans and, and stuff like that. But the biggest thing for me, those awards were, were great and the promotion was great. But the biggest thing for me was people were saying, Lynn, you're different. What is it? And mm -hmm. I used to say, I play for Jesus. And they were mm -hmm. like, what? And they'd say, what? So you play for God? And I'd say, yeah. And they put, Linvoy plays for Harry Redknapp who is God? And I said, no, no, <laughs> no. I play for Jesus. Yes. And, um, and because I was vocal, quite vocal about it in terms of they could see the evidence on the pitch, so it gave me a right to talk about it off the pitch. And, um, and there was a lot more going on around that, but mm. that was the moment that I saw that the Christian faith wasn't just about Sunday morning, mm. that it was 24-7, Mm. And, um, and in the end, you know, after three years, 
there were nine footballers at the club who were Christians. Uh, we had prayer meetings before games. Mm -hmm. um, alpha courses ran from the football club. So there was lots, lots going on. It just showed me that you know the, the Christian life that I thought I would have to lead as a kid and thought that that's what it was like was so opposite to that, that it was so free and so enjoyable. But within all of that, there were still many, many struggles, like mm. real big struggles. So it wasn't plain sailing. No, there are issues. Yeah. yeah. Time's gone. It's a fascinating story. But very quickly, how long ago was that? that you 2001. Came? Okay, so... Um, now you're not playing anymore, are you? Not playing, no. Do you play a bit on the side on a Saturday I, morning? I'd like to, but uh, I don't get picked, so no one no. wants me. <laughs> no, just due to, due to injuries and things. Right, okay. uh, what do you do now? So I work for Christians in Sport full-time. So uh, the chaplain that mentored me and discipled me um, and you know, just helped me understand the Bible and the, the Christian life, I do the same now with professional footballers. So you travel the country and Tra help. Yeah, yeah, yeah amazing. Yeah. And wife, one daughter. How many other children? So two boys. Two. And, yeah. Are and they my, footballers? Well, interestingly enough, it's my daughter that's the footballer. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> she, she's the best footballer in the Primus house. She played for England and Chelsea, but she's in America now. She's playing out, playing out there. She's got a game to tonight that we can watch uh, via um, streaming it. So we'll be watching her at one o'clock in the morning. Will you really? Yeah. Rooting for her. Rooting for her, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's great to have you, Roy. And I know you've got to go back to Portsmouth, but you will hang around and talk with us. Yeah, of course I you? will, definitely. If I could offer you, you know, I don't know, 10 FA Cup trophies, mm. all you've got to do, just deny Christ. Just, just leave all that and, and I'll make you the best footballer. You know, Pele will... Fade into insignificance <laughs> compared with you. Would you go for it? Not a chance. Not a chance. Honestly, I, I always said I made three amazing decisions in my life. The first one was to accept Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. And the moment I said that prayer, I didn't know what was going to happen. Mm. The second was uh, to, to marry my wife, Trish. And the third was a tackle I made on Wayne Rooney. You know, he, he <laughs> fell over. <laughs> The referee didn't give a penalty, so I was like, well, I've, that must be a good decision. But, you know, following Jesus uh, and understanding that I was more than a footballer and there was more in my life than what he had to, that I thought uh, was the best decision ever. Great, sorry. Thank you very much. No Let's problem, show Roger. our appreciation. For Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Well, thanks. Do stay around. I know that Linvoy always stays around and chats, so please go up and have a word with him. But that was really good. Thank you. It's always been a pleasure to interview uh, Linvoy. I just want to tr sort of round things off. Obviously, we're trying to share something of the, of the Christian message. I, I don't know about you, but I look back on my life and there are certain moments that were totally unforgettable. None of them, you know, quite like yours. But uh, I, I remember, for example, um, I was 13 years of age and it was a Friday evening and remarkably I was doing my homework. I, I, I never really enjoyed school or homework, but I was up there in my bedroom, age 13, doing my homework. And I just remember my dad coming and it was in the evening and he just, he, he just came into the bedroom and he said, he said, Roger... President Kennedy's been assassinated. And I can still picture it. And I can picture my dad, he's long since died, but I can picture him and, and the expression he had on his face and this sorrowful moment. I know where I was when the Twin Towers came down. I, it, it's never been forgotten. I know exactly what happened when I heard the news of, of Princess Diana being killed. I was in Belfast as it happens. And uh, the, the, I was staying with a couple and... Uh, the guy just knocked on the bedroom door in the morning and said, Roger, come and see the news. Princess Diana's been killed. It's amazing. It's certain things stay in our mind, the memorable moments. Uh, I, I don't know whether you're aware, if you've watched the BBC, amazingly, even they have covered this this week and the week before, but 500 years ago on Tuesday, 
Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses, objections really, to the Roman Catholic Church, to a church door in Wittenberg in Germany, and that was going to be the trigger, the the catalyst to bring about the Reformation. Now, I wasn't there for that, and I don't remember that moment, but in history, I recognise that was incredibly significant. And the passage I read earlier ties in with what we've just heard from Linvoy and this idea of memorable moments. Here is this guy, Isaiah, We know a little bit about him. He was certainly an aristocrat. He worked amidst royalty. One of the great experts on the book of Isaiah says almost certainly he was the king's physician because he certainly gave great medical advice later on to the king. But here is Isaiah and he's going to have an encounter with God that he'll never forget. And and he pinpoints it. In the year that King Uzziah died, he says, I saw the Lord. And for him, the the, the sort of marker in his history was, oh, that was the year that the the king died. The king was an okay king. In fact, he was was quite a good king. There were some mistakes and and there were some wrong judgments. But nevertheless, Uzziah's died. But in that year, I saw the Lord. Now, I don't know how you feel about something like that. You hear a story from Linvoy saying, look, I, I, I remember... I prayed, okay, it didn't all suddenly slot into place, but a few weeks later I began to understand more. And and he can talk about those moments. And it was to change him, change him forever. And it was exactly the same for Isaiah. He, He saw the Lord, but he saw the Lord as high and lifted up. And then you get that word repeated three times. It's the only sort of attribute of God that's repeated three times. He's holy, holy, holy. And, and okay, it may have been a vision, whatever he saw, but he couldn't get it out of his mind. God's told us various things about himself. He, he's told that he's, he's eternal, that he knows all things, he can do all things. God is everywhere. God is a spirit. God is just one God, but he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons in the Godhead. Perhaps that's why he's holy, holy, holy. A God who's just, a God who's loving, a God who eventually will come into our world. He sees the Lord, this infinite God. Now, I don't know most of you at all, I'm afraid, but when, when you start to think about God, I wonder if you've got thoughts similar to, to Linvoy's. You, you just sort of think of those experiences as a child when you went to, I don't know, church or maybe just a school chapel service or whatever, and it put you off the thought of God and it all seemed very antiquated and distant. <coughs> Well, yes, here is Isaiah, and he sees this infinite God. And interestingly, as soon as he, as it were, sees the Lord, he then sees himself. Because he says, oh, where am I? I I, I just feel unclean. My my lips, they've spoken such terrible words. I, I just feel dirty and grubby. Well, if God is holy, and by holy, it doesn't just mean that God's never done anything wrong. It means he's intrinsically pure and holy. He cannot, by nature, do wrong. And suddenly Isaiah sees himself, well, I have done wrong. We've had an interesting week in politics, haven't we, when suddenly things are being exposed from years ago. And they they may not seem particularly significant, but significant enough to resign because of this. I just feel unclean. I'm not worthy of this position. How can I be consistently saying this? And yet I know in the past I've done that. Aren't we all a little like that? Robert Louis Stevenson said, we all have thoughts that would shame even hell. And I think that's probably true. The Bible's incredibly blunt. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. Uh, And I know that to be true of myself. Sometimes, you know, I'm speaking about Christian things in the church or wherever, and I think, who am I to do that? You know, if people knew what I was really like, would they listen to me? And that's exactly how Isaiah felt. Here's this infinite holy God. I see him. But I see myself as so different. (coughs) And then, I don't know whether you picked it up, but we read at the beginning of that Isaiah chapter 6 chapter. And then a little bit later on, he heard the Lord. So he not only saw the Lord, but he then heard the Lord and, and God spoke to him. So this infinite God is now becoming an intimate God. Is God out there and able and wanting 
to communicate to people like you and me? It seems incredible because, let's face it, we are small. Some of us are smaller than others, but compared with the vastness of this universe, who are we? We're just minuscule, aren't we? And yet, will this God who is, well, uh, the Bible says that heaven and the heaven of heavens can't contain him. This vast God, is he willing to communicate to such as me or Isaiah or Linvoy? And yet he sees the Lord and then he sees himself. He hears the Lord and then he speaks to God. So God speaking to us and us speaking to him. I don't know whether you've ever prayed and just thought, there could be millions of people at this split second praying. Is God hearing all of these things? Well, clearly God heard Isaiah because God responds and speaks more to him and explains things. So what is the difference between those early verses in that chapter and the later verses, this infinite God, now the intimate God, what's in between? Well, in between is forgiveness. Now, actually, Linvoy pointed it out very clearly. He said right at the beginning of time, Adam and Eve sinned against God. They, they basically shook the, their fist in the face of God and said, God, we don't want you to rule over us. We're doing our own thing. They were to discover the knowledge of good and evil. God never desired that humanity should discover evil, but they did. And all of creation was wrecked and ruined. And there came this separation between a holy God and sinful humanity. And we're all bound up in that, aren't we? And yet, right in the middle is forgiveness. The way it's put there in this vision is that the seraphim, the angel, comes and takes coals and, and purges, cleanses away the sin and the guilt of Isaiah's lips and all that he said and done. And do you know, our Christian message is very, very simple. It is about this great God. And it is an honest reflection on ourselves that phew, some of us may have had various degrees of success. I've nothing compared with Linvoy, and maybe you feel the same. But nevertheless, I, I know I'm not the man. I know I'm not the person that God created me to be. Aren't we all like this? So how can we see and hear God? Because of forgiveness. The God who brought all things into being is a God who, yes, knows every detail of all of our lives, but is willing to forgive. Now, it's interesting, of course, here's Isaiah. He's, he's seeing all of this 700 years before Jesus was born. But very significantly, because we call it a prophecy, he, he's speaking about things that are going to happen, as well as speaking to the people the message of God. The next chapter, if I had carried on reading, says God is going to give a sign. A virgin will conceive and bring forth into the world a child. You think, oh, wow, that's very unusual. And then a couple of chapters later, you have those words. And if you know the music of Handel's Messiah, you'll certainly know these words, but they're taken straight from uh, the book of Isaiah. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government, there'll be no end. A child is going to be born, a son's going to be given, who is the Mighty God? Who's the Everlasting Father? That's exactly it. A couple of months' time, we'll be commemorating the birth of the Lord Jesus. We'll celebrate Christmas, and we love it. What's it all about? This vast God, big enough to become small. God, strong enough to become weak. The creator becoming like us, his creation. God clothing himself in humanity. God coming into our world. Uh, and that's what Isaiah spoke about. Oh, so there's forgiveness. And, and, and how's that possible? Well, God is going to come into the world in a miraculous way. But then you carry on reading and eventually you come to an incredible chapter. It starts at the end of chapter 52 and it goes through to chapter 53. It's a very significant chapter because... Isaiah, in detail, describes the death of this coming Messiah. He describes in detail what we clearly see as, well, this is crucifixion. The bones of the body being pulled apart, but not a bone of the body broken. He's dying, he's suffering, he's taking on himself the sin of the world. 
And, and, and that with the other prophecies, that he's going to die between two thieves. He's going to die a poor man's death and be buried in a rich man's tomb. They're going to gamble for his garments. He's going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Even some of the words that would be spoken round about the cross, they're, they're written there prophetically. And you, you think, wow, was the biography of, written, of Jesus written before he was born? And the answer is, yes, it was. Because the prophets looked forward to this coming Messiah. They looked forward to Jesus coming into our world and going to a cross and carrying on himself our sin, our breaking of the commandments, our thinking and speaking and doing that which is wrong, our rebellion, that which cuts us off from God. God scooped up and laid on his darling son Jesus who paid the penalty for our wrongdoing. This infinite God becoming an intimate God through forgiveness, which Jesus purchased on the cross. And as Lynn Voice said, he not only died and was buried, but rose. And so the question comes, not so much the unforgettable moment, though for me it certainly was. I can tell you the exact date when I became a Christian and the place, I remember the circumstances, all that led up to it. But that's not what's particularly significant. And again, Linvoy said this, what is significant is he came into a relationship with God. Isaiah did. Linvoy did. I've had this same sort of experience for me as well. I had no sort of ecstatic emotion. But I'll tell you, I came to know God and he gave me spiritual life and a desire to get to know him more and live for him consistently day by day. So I just want to ask, if I may, has there ever come that moment, that decisive act in your life when you've said, yeah, I want to see the Lord. I want to hear him. I need to be forgiven. I want to enter into a relationship with God. Now, let's be honest, the world around us at the moment is sort of putting huge pressure uh, against having this relationship with God. We're living in a very secular Western world at the moment. But nevertheless, there are men and women, there are young people, older people, there are people from all sorts of backgrounds. Some have experienced success, others not particularly, but they've come to that moment when they've said, God, Would you please forgive me? Would you come and live in my life? Would you become my Lord and my Saviour? I wonder if that's ever happened to you. Let me finish quickly with this last story. I went, just before this meeting began, we went um, into Matt's room, Linvoy, Matt and and myself, and um, I, I saw a picture on the wall and I said, oh, I love that picture. It's painted by Vincent van Gogh. It was painted five years before he died. I I don't know how much you know about him. He was born in Zundert in southern Holland. His father was a pastor of a church. And and he was very devout. In fact, when he came and lived in London, Vincent van Gogh used to go and hear the great Victorian preacher of that day and age, a man called Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Every Sunday, he would go and listen to Spurgeon preach. He had a congregation of 6,000. Can you imagine it? And there was Vincent van Gogh. In the evening, he used to go to the East End and he used to preach the message himself in the open air to anybody who would listen. He went to Antwerp. He went to study the Bible, but it was one of those colleges which, instead of revering what God said, wanted just to destroy it, and he began to doubt his faith. He met Gauguin, who was no help to him at all, and introduced him to the the brothels of Antwerp. And he sort of found himself drifting far away from everything he knew about God and the relationship that he'd enjoyed with God. And then five years before his death, he painted this picture. Matt, I don't know whether we're allowed to go and nose in your room and see it. Um, it's called An Open Bible, A Book and a Candlestick. And you look carefully at the Bible. It's tiny there, but if you look at it on Google or something, you'll see it's open at Isaiah 53, which is the part that describes Jesus dying for our sin. But all the words have just become a blur. And the candle which once shone, shed light on the, the Bible, it's gone out. And actually near it is a book called La Joie de Vie. It was a banned erotic novel, but it's well thumbed and well read. And he's really saying, do you know, 
I chose this rather than the light that Isaiah would talked about all those centuries ago. Now, maybe you're like that. But I really, very earnestly, if I may, I'd love you to say, I, I may have lived like this for so long, but I want to turn from that which is wrong and I want to ask the Lord Jesus Christ who loved me and died for me to forgive me and become my Lord and Saviour. And do you know, if you were to pray a prayer, simple, just as Lynn Voice said, God would hear a prayer of saying, God, forgive me, come and live within me, become my Lord and my Saviour. God would hear that. Years ago, I stood at the front of a church and I said words like, I will and I do and okay if you insist. And there was a young lady standing next to me and she said very similar words, not the last bit. And um, <laughs> do you know, it, it radically changed my life. I, I have an empty wallet to prove it. And uh, my wife, she just lives a life of luxury and ease all because I said those words. But they were to change my life, just words. And God wants us to come to him with words that express an attitude I've seen you, but I want to hear you. I want intimacy with you. Would you forgive me and bring me to know you? And do you know God would hear that prayer if you earnestly prayed it? I want to finish, if I may, and Matt will just tell us one or two. There are some great courses, and you can do some one-to-one -one Bible studies if you want, just to discover more of these things, and Matt will tell us now. But I want to finish with a prayer, if I may. Well, actually, a couple of prayers. So I want to pray for Linvoy and his family, uh, and for us. But before that, a prayer that you might pray tonight. If you would say, God, I want you, please, to forgive me and make me yours. And I would encourage, I would urge you, really, to pray it with me. And if you pray it with me, I'd love you to do just one other thing as well, if you may. At the end, I'll be out there. Just come up to me and say, Roger, I prayed with you tonight. And I have a booklet. It's called Trust in Christ. It has the prayer in it and some tips about starting to live day by day with a close relationship with God. I'd love to give you one of these if you come to me. I'll perhaps get somebody to chat with you if you want. But if not, just take the booklet. Wouldn't it be amazing if tonight this was the night you were born for? the unforgettable moment when you come to know God who loved us and gave himself for us. So a prayer, and then I'll pray for Linvoy. If you can pray with me, do make this prayer your own. Dear God, you know everything there is to know about me. So I want to say I am sorry for all that is wrong. And I do believe Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. Please forgive me. Come and live within me. Become my Lord and Saviour and help me to follow you. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, we do thank you for tonight. We thank you for the refreshments the food, the drink, and each other, and being here in such comfortable surroundings. Thank you for Linvoy's story. And we want to pray for him and his wife and his children, and the daughter in the States at the moment. We commit them all to you. Look after them, go before them, and help them to be a real blessing to those whom they meet day by day. And for us, you know everything there is to know about each one of us. And so we commit ourselves to you and our loved ones. Draw near to us, we pray. Keep us safe as we travel home, but bless us now as we enjoy chatter and time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
one line.